Cooking in the 18th century was hard work. And a taste of history, I will keep true to those early American ways, using spider parts, resting in open flames, as they create everything from sauces to side dishes to main courses. There were no microwave ovens or frozen dinners. It takes a strong back to do this type of cooking, but I come from a sturdy Hessian heritage, so I can take it. This incredible frigate, L'Hermion, was built as a testimony to the friendship between France and America and the many historic events that forever bound the two nations. Today, in honor of the Marquis de Lafayette, we're preparing a salade de moule with artichoke, calf's liver with apples in Calvados. And for dessert, we're making Thomas Jefferson's favorite Floden Island that I'm sure he served the Marquis de Lafayette in Monticello. I'm Chef Walter Stave here in Rochefort, France. I'm excited to share with you the rebuilding of General Lafayette's Frigates of Freedom and a taste of history. In March of 1780, the Marquis de Lafayette set sail to America on the frigate Le Mion. He brings with him the king's commitment of French troops and a naval alliance which will change the course of America's War of Independence. Lafayette was a remarkable individual who cast his fortunes with America and never lost sight of that throughout his long and eventful life. Gilbert Lafayette was born into a family of French nobility and military lineage. Before Lafayette's second birthday, his father is killed battling the British early on in the Seven Years' War. Americans know this war as the French and Indian War, which was fought between Britain and France for control and possession of North America. This was a hard defeat for French people because we, we lost America at this time. So French people wanted to get a revenge against the English. At the end of the war, Lafayette moves to Paris and enters college at age 11. He also became a member of the Black Musketeers. While posted with his regiment, he learns about America's struggles with Great Britain and resolves to join the fight. For Lafayette, this question of liberty was going to be won in America. He arrives in Philadelphia, where he meets General George Washington at the City Tavern, and the two form a friendship and mutual respect that will last the rest of their lives. In return for his ardent support of the colonies, Lafayette is given the rank general, but not a commission at first. He soon proves himself in battle and is wounded at Brandywine. After recovering, he returns to duty and takes charge of a division of Virginia troops to command at the Battle of Monmouth. Even though he was very young, Lafayette was a very good soldier. So General Washington relied on him. A little more than a year into his commission, 21-year-old Lafayette returns to France for his most important mission, to convince King Louis XVI to support America's war for independence. It takes more than a year of perseverance, but his efforts pay off. In March of 1780, he boards the frigate L'Hermione and sails to America. Back on American soil, Lafayette assumes his role as Major General in the final stages of the Revolutionary War. Washington sent Lafayette into Virginia. Lafayette really played sort of a cat and mouse game with Cornwallis, ultimately taking up a position in Yorktown that, of course, was the final campaign. As a result of the brilliant efforts on the part of American and French forces, Cornwallis is compelled to surrender. 
Lafayette and Washington had one of the great friendships in American history, and it's very surprising because Lafayette was a 19-year-old French aristocrat. George Washington was a 47-year-old taciturn commander of this ragtag army of Continentals. The two men remained close personal friends until the death of Washington in 1799. I'm making a very spectacular dish, which is a moulin artichoke. And I got my inspiration for this dish in visiting the spectacular market in Rochefort, France. That's a beautiful artichoke, look at that. We are the more. The preparation of the artichokes takes a little bit of time. 25 to 30 minutes to cook, until later you'll be able to peel off the leaves. This is just water with a little bit of salt. The salad needs some color and also the flavor. And there's no better flavor than a red onion. Good olive oil. It will sit up for at least 15 to 20 minutes until your artichoke is ready. Just cut the bottom in small pieces, mix it all together. Fantastic. So you see the mussels are all opened up nicely. Take them out of the shell. This is my tribute to the Marquis de Lafayette, my mule and artichoke salad. Unbelievable. I am sure that the Marquis de Lafayette, when he visited Monticello, my hero Thomas Jefferson, had calf's liver. Because at the Jefferson household, calf's liver was served at least once a week. The Hermione is the famous ship that ferried the Marquis de Lafayette to America, where he would play a strategic role in the War for Independence. However, 13 years after its historic voyage, Hermione ran aground and was wrecked. The initial ship took only six months to build. This time around, it's 20 years in the making. Today, a near-perfect replica of this historic ship is being painstakingly rebuilt to its original specifications in France, on the banks of the River Chiron. Here in Rochefort, in the place where the ship was built, it was the shipyard of the King of France in the 18th century. We are building a ship to sail, and we are also touching history, and it's quite amazing. This frigate, stretching 210 feet, will retrace the path of its namesake by sailing to America in May of 2015. The idea was to rebuild the ship as close as possible so we have been able to find the same materials as it was used in 18th century. Rope for rigging, oak and pine for the hull and masts, and a hemp linen blend for sails. The important thing was to go in the history and to search and to know what's happened in this time and why did they choose that. So it was the first interesting part of the job. The original Hermione was a light frigate built for speed and maneuverability rather than huge firepower. Even still, Hermione was capable of fighting and fitted with 26 cannons and eight smaller guns. We are not allowed to have the, the real cannons which are able to fight against the English. <laughs> but the architect was still obliged to keep the guns, which add essential stability to the ship and counterbalance to the more than 16,000 square feet of sail. The second challenge was to assemble a ship that was seaworthy and able to meet present day regulations for nautical safety. When you are a sailor, you have to know which rope is which. It's really important and you have to be observant. I'm really scared. I mean, it's fantastic because it's really important, not only sail making, but working on this project and sailing the boat. One of the most important ingredients in shipbuilding was the ropes. I'm standing in front of the Corte Royale, the Royal Ropery. Designed for making ropes for the Navy. And what is interesting here, the building is actually a bit more than 300 meters long. This was necessary for making one cable length. So we'll sail again with a ship who sailed uh, more than two centuries ago. Now that the replica of the Hermione is complete, it will sail to America's eastern seaboard 
stopping in 12 iconic ports of call, relevant to the War of Independence, starting in Yorktown, Virginia. This commemoration to the first historic voyage also celebrates the enduring alliance between the United States and France. In a modern kitchen, people use a torch and just torch over it. Today, however, since we are here in Charles Thompson's estate, Bruce, who is the historian, made me actually an 18th century salamander. And the salamander comes from a piece of metal that's on a stick that discolors itself. So it's been called salamander from the 17th, 18th century. That if you go to a kitchen today and the people say, put in the salamander, everybody knows it's like a cheese melter. So I have the salamander under fire. I can hear it and I can see it. A little bit more, get a nice golden crust. Ah, look at that. Amazing. What Beautiful. a job. Thank you, Thomas Jefferson. I guarantee you, that's the first time, at least that I know of, that anybody ever recreated a salamander and actually placed a creme brulee. I am convinced that the Marquis de Lafayette would have never had a spectacular meal as we just did without a very spectacular dessert. Floating islands. There we go. Mm. It's so pretty, it's so tasty, and it's so much a taste of history. <laughs>